Romans 15, 4 to 6 reads, and I quote, For whatever things were written before were written for our learning. They were written for what reason? Are you really learning? You just do Bible study, you read through, and it doesn't read through you. For whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that we through the patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Now may the God of patience and comfort grant you to be like-minded toward one another, according to Christ Jesus, that you may with one mind, with one mouth, glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. If that is going to happen, it means we are having the same experiences. If only one person is having breakthrough, we cannot be of one mind. Envy will come in. A jealous spirit will take over some. Some will become bitter. But in the year of full, complete, and total restoration, your experience will be like my experience. My experience will be like yours. In the mighty name of Jesus, we'll all be mightily blessed by God and fully restored. I like the prayer that was prayed at the beginning. This morning when Elder Wally last Sunday was leading that prayer, I was part of it. I was not physically present. I connected in the spirit. He said, these things were not so from the beginning. And it took us the very beginning. Be fruitful. Can I hear amen? amen. Multiply. Replenish the earth. Subdue it. Have dominion. How many of you know that the things that were given to us before time began cannot be nullified or canceled in time? So right now, everything God purposed for my life, I will fulfill. How about you? So those things were written so that we can learn and have hope. One of those things written is Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1 to 3. Now faith is the assurance, the confirmation, the tie to deed of the things we hope for. Hello. <laughs> I'm not sure you are connecting both. The things that were written before were written for our learning that we might have hope. But for that hope to come into reality and not just be a pipe dream, I need my faith. Now faith is, go back to verse 1, is the assurance, the confirmation, the title deed of things we hope for. That is the moment there's an impartation of faith, especially the gift of faith, whether it's seed or fruit or gift of word of faith that invades your womb, your spirit womb. You now have title deed in your hand. Being the proof of things we do not see. And the conviction of their reality, faith perceiving as real fact what is not revealed to the senses. For by faith, and what's that? Trust and holy favor, born of faith, the men of old had divine testimony born to them and obtained a good report. By faith, this is where I'm coming, we understand that the words, and I told, I told it as Aeon, the ages, the ages, that the words during the successive ages were framed, fashioned, put in order, and equipped for their intended purpose. By what? By the word of God. Today we shall continue with part two of our message titled, Fear Not, the age we live in has long ago been framed by the word of God. <laughs> because his word will not fail. What he framed cannot fail. Fear not, the age we live in has long ago been framed by the word of God. Two critical questions I asked before I will ask again. Are all the ages truly framed by the word of God? And what is your answer? Yes, we'll find out. Number two, 
If those ages are framed by the word of God, and all ages, including the hours, are framed by the word of God, how can we access what God has framed by his word for our own age? On Sunday the 24th of January, I shared with you one clear example of how these things work. I share with you that the captivity of the children of Israel in Egypt and their deliverance from the house of bondage were framed by the word of God before even the children of Israel came into being. In Genesis chapter 15, verse 13 to 16, God Almighty framed the age that the children, the descendants of Abraham, the children of Israel would live in. He framed their age by his word. Then he said to Abraham, No, certainly, somebody say certainly. That means without fail. No, certainly, that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs. And we serve them. And they will afflict them 400 years. And also the nation whom they serve, I will judge. Afterward, they shall come out with great possession. Now as for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried at a good old age. That is when God framed the future of the descendants of Abraham, he was not going to be alive to see it, but that future had already been framed. Their forerunner to Egypt was Joseph, whose role was to preserve a posterity in Egypt. He also was framed by the word of God, not only by Mrs. Potiphar. Genesis, I beg your pardon, Psalm 105, verse 16 to 24. Psalm 105, 16 to 24. Moreover, he called for a famine in the land. Whenever God wants to do a thing, the negative may go on first. The ridiculous may follow. But you can be rest, rest assured, at the end of the negative and the, the ridiculous, the miraculous will come. So don't, don't join those who murmur and grumble that there's nothing good in this country. There's nothing good about this government. This government has failed Nigeria. This government has done this. I'm not saying whether those things are so or not. I don't have all the facts, okay? But I can see the pain. I can see the anguish. I can see the unrest. I can see the disorder in society. But hear me, when I heard such comments at home, a few days ago, I was on the dining table and there were people with us and they sat and they were commenting what had happened to Nigeria, businesses are failing. I got up from the dining table, I didn't tell them what I was going to do. I put off the light. I put off the light. Now that you put off the light, I said, yes. Keep on talking. Keep on spreading darkness. And they paused. And then I switched on the light, and you could see their faces. I said, light has no relevance, relevance when there is no darkness. So let it down. The whole hour will be governed and be overcome with darkness. It will be the finest hour for the church to rise and shine and give hope to people. Can I hear amen? Arise and shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen up. Darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people. It doesn't matter who is stealing what. There is still much more to be exploited. Do you understand me? There is still much more in this land. And God has preserved those things that are not seen by those who are stealing. So that those who will not steal can use it right. <laughs> Somebody say, let there be light. Don't join those who spread darkness. Be a beacon of light. Can I hear amen? Psalm 105, verse 13 to 16. Moreover, I call for a famine in the land. It destroy all the provision of bread. <laughs> I can't get out of this. I have to do it. I was talking to friend, friends of mine. We constantly meet in Abuja to discuss about the future, the present of Nigeria, 
the present, the future, and what we think can be done, what should be done. And while they were talking, I said to them, why I can never give up on Nigeria? And why I will never give up on President Buhari? I said, because he can only do his bit if he's a foreigner, others will come and fix it. I would never give up on him. Why? Because any friendship that ends never started. Regardless of what he does, it's one person. Regardless of who surrounds him. I said, the number two reason why I cannot give up on Nigeria was the circumstances of my birth. When I was born for the first three years, I was lame in both my feet and I demonstrated it to them. This was the way I would walk to take water. This is your... That was the way I was walking. Until my third birthday, I got up and I started running. I said, my mother never gave up on me. If she had given up on me, I would have given up. Even if Nigeria is crawling and can't walk, I will never give up on this nation. No matter what happens, I will not give up on this nation because my destiny is intertwined with that of this nation. Nigeria will be saved. Nigeria will be changed. Nigeria will become great in my lifetime. In the name of Jesus Christ. Let's read. Let's read. Don't think I will give up. And all those who want me to become like them, you miss it big time. But when we're through, we'll invite you to the table of brotherhood for a meal. Moreover, I call for a famine in the land. It is only all the provision of bread. He sent a man before them. Joseph was sold as a slave. The heart is filled with fetters. He was laid in irons. Was that comfortable? If the psalm did not capture it, when you read Genesis, you never saw his feet in chains. All you read is that, oh, the jailer put everything in his hand because God was with him. But he was tested before he was trusted. Oh, I can't hear you. <laughs> he will not be thrown to jail. First day, and the jailer said, welcome, here is jail. No! They put him in chains, he was smiling. They put him in fetters, he knew it was process before progress. Do you understand me? He knew it was not solitary confinement, it is solitary refinement that God has walked on the inside of him so that the God that walks in him can walk through him. This is why I remain totally persuaded that Nigeria will make it. I'm an incurable optimist as far as Nigeria is concerned. I will see it. And you will see it too. The heart is filled with fetters was laid in irons until the time that his word came to pass. The word of the Lord tested him. If the word of the Lord does not test you, your word cannot come to pass. You don't get the point. Your word is going to rule the atmosphere. He said, at the command of Joseph, Pharaoh said it. Every knee should bow. And by his word, he will govern the whole of Egypt. But you can't get there except the word of the Lord has tested you. And no test, no examination is easy. That's the time you pray. You don't see visions. You don't see dreams. You don't hear anything. Why? A bad teacher is the one that tells the students answers in the midst of examination. When you are going through that test, you may see no vision, no dream, nothing may come. But you are latching onto the word until it comes to pass. The king sent and released him. The ruler of the people let him go free. <laughs> he made him lord of his house and ruler of all his possessions. To bind his princes at his pleasure and teach his elders wisdom. If you check that in the King James Version of the Bible, the word elders there is senators. Senate or senators is not a political word. It's a biblical word. And until men feel with wisdom of God sitting in our senate, all they will be doing is budget padding and all kinds of ridiculous nonsense. There are some of them that are good. There are some of them that are bad. But God is going to fill that house 
with godly and God-fearing people in the name of Jesus. Their forerunner to Egypt was Joseph. Their sojourn in the land of Egypt began when Jacob, at the invitation of Joseph and Pharaoh, gathered all the 70 people in his household to go to the land of Egypt to start living. He didn't go there without hearing from God. Genesis 46, 1 to 7. Genesis 46, 1 to 7. So Israel took his journey with all that he heard and came to Beersheba. How many of you remember Beersheba? Beersheba was a place where Abraham the father built an altar, planted a tamarisk tree, the fruit of which you would not eat over 100. He was planting it for the future. And he called upon the name for the first time of everlasting God. From that day on, any of his descendants that showed up in Beersheba, heaven opened. So Jacob went to Beersheba and offered sacrifices to the God of his father, Isaac, who himself had gone to Beersheba. Then God spoke to Israel in the visions of the night and said, Jacob, Jacob, he said, here I am. So he said, I'm God, the God of your father. Do not fear to go down to Egypt, for I will make you a great nation there. I will go down with you to Egypt and will also surely bring you up again. But you'll be dead before I do. Joseph will put his hand on your eyes. So I'm bringing you up. You'll not be buried in Egypt. Joseph will be the one to close your eyes in death and give you a state burial. The kind that was never seen before. Then Jacob arose from Beersheba. And the sons of Israel carried their father Jacob, their little ones and their wives, in the carts which Pharaoh had sent to carry him. If you've read that story well, you'll be so excited. They took their donkeys, they went to Egypt to buy corn, and Joseph said, set aside your donkeys. And Pharaoh said, give them new mummy wagons, the kind of wagons that we have just bought. Let them take their donkeys back home, but let them go in this new wagon, and this is for their father. Oh my God. When, fa- when the father Jacob saw all that his, his heart stood still, and they said to him, Papa, we lied to you that a white beast had turned him. Joseph is alive, is governor over Egypt. My days of joyful sorrow is around the corner. You didn't hear what you said, amen, to. I said, My days of joyful sorrow is around the corner. The day that I'll be crying because of joy when I see you in strategic places. In the mighty name of Jesus. How many people left? Verse 26 to 27. This is a summary of what I thought before is necessary before I launch into the deep. All the persons who went to Jacob, with Jacob to Egypt, who came from his body besides Jacob's son, wives, were 66 persons in all. And the sons of Joseph who were born to him in Egypt were two persons. All the persons of the house of Jacob who went to Egypt were 70. 70 people landed in Egypt. By the time what was framed for them began to unfold, it would look like the enemy hated them. And the one who was in charge of that was also God. I'm going to show you in the Bible. That God stirred up the people against them. The more they afflicted them, the more they grew. When they left Egypt, there were six million able-bodied men, minus women and children, and mixed multitude. Seventy to six million. It takes time to cook his meal. It takes time for God to cook his meal. But when he set the table, he must be in the presence of your enemies. So stop praying for your enemies to die. There will be no people, spectators, to look at you eat. The people grew and multiplied in Egypt until another Pharaoh arose that did not know Joseph and he dealt harshly with the children of Israel. That story is in Exodus chapter 1 verse 1 to 22. Read it for your pleasure. I will summarize it for you from Psalm 105. Exodus 1 1 to 22. Write it down. And now I will read Psalm 105 to see who turned the people against them. 
who turned the Egyptians against them. You blame Pharaoh. You, Pharaoh is a wicked man. No, there was a Pharaoh that welcomed them. Not all Pharaohs are bad. Not all Fulanis are evil. Stop the nonsense going on in our land. There are criminals among Fulanis. There are criminals among Yorubas. There are criminals among Igbos. Don't make a sweeping statement to wipe, paint everybody with the same, with the same paint. The Lord will begin to diminish the criminals among us. East, west, north, and south. And let a new culture evolve in our land. Don't misuse your tongue. And bastardize everybody and just call everyone names. What do you want to say about me? If I tell you the story of my life now, they'll call me full of me. So I'll keep quiet. I'm a thoroughbred Nigerian. And the hope of Africa is in getting Nigeria right. So that every black man everywhere can walk tall. Can I hear amen? amen. Psalm 105, verse 23 to 25. Who really did it? Is it Pharaoh? Israel also came into Egypt. And Jacob dwelt in the land of Ham. He increased his people greatly and made them stronger than their enemies. He turned their heart to hate his people, to deal craftily with his servants. Who turned their heart? I can't hear you. No, you are not serious. Who turned their heart? So why blame Pharaoh? But when the time of the promise that God made to Abraham, when the time of the promise drew near, Moses was born. At the time he was born, Pharaoh had already given command. Every female child should be spared. They do not know about deadly daughters who are wired by God like Esther, who bring the head of Amon, the Agagite down, <laughs> as she was, she was positioned in the palace. They have not read about Deborah. Do you understand me? They say, spare the women. They're good for nothing. I'm sure Pharaoh jumped from the sky to the earth. He had no mother. He gave a decree that all the male children must be pumped, drowned in water. It was that time that Moses was born. The Bible says in Hebrews 11 that he was a proper child. They've had two children before. They said, this one is different. It looks different. It did things differently. But it was a little baby. And the Bible says it was well pleasing to God. When the time of the promise drew near, Moses was born. Let's catch some of those things that happened. Come with me to Acts 7. Is a summary of what happened then in Exodus chapter 2. Acts 7, verse 17. I'll read a few portions there. But when the time of the promise drew near, which God had sworn to who? Abraham, when he framed the future. The people grew and multiplied in Egypt till another king arose who did not know Joseph. This man dead treacherously with our people and oppressed our forefathers, making them expose their babies so that they might not leave. At this time, Moses was born and was well pleasing to God as a little child. He had done nothing. He was well pleasing to God because all that would make him please God had been put on the inside of him. And he was brought up in his father's house for how long? For three months. But when he was set out, Pharaoh's daughter took him away and brought him up as her own son. And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and deeds. Now, when he was 40 years old, look at the patience of God. When he was 40 years old, you know why? It would have been 360 years that the children of Israel had been under affliction. Are you with me? So, when he was 40, it would be 360 years. So, there's need for another 40 years before the deliverance will come. But God had to prepare his own that would do it. Are you listening to me? But Moses thought it was time. Now when he was 40 years old, it 
eat, not eat, not eat. <laughs> eat was that the force of destiny. Eat came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. And seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended and avenged him who was oppressed and struck down the Egyptian. For he supposed that his brethren would have understood the eat that came into his heart. That would have understood that God would deliver them by his hand. But they did not understand. Do you see people throwing stones at me and you are angry? That's the assignment. But with all the stones they throw, they will still come to the table of brotherhood. Because what they are doing will not work. Put it all together. You are going to find out why it will not work. Get the best of your generals. Get the best of your lieutenant. Get the best of your men. It will not work that way. Why? The way to work has been revealed to us and you're not willing to learn. It has nothing to do with PhD. It has to do with prophetic destiny and those who know it and those who know how to latch onto it. It does not belong to one person because the secrets of the Lord are with them that fear him. It's not wrong that you are trying to make things happen, but keep on wasting your time like Moses. Until the fullness of time, nothing will happen. Let's read. Go on. For he supposed that his brethren would have understood that God would deliver them by his hand, but they did not understand. And the next day he appeared to two of them as they were fighting and tried to reconcile them, saying, man, you are brethren, man. Can I speak American here? Man, you are brethren. Why do you wrong one another? <laughs> That shows I lived there before. And the next day, okay, read on, go on. But he who did his neighbor wrong, pushed him away saying, who made you a ruler and a judge? They had sinned, but they did not put the proper interpretation that this guy is going to be a ruler. This guy is a judge. But how dare you, Moses? All the time you are in the palace enjoying. How dare you come here and judge between me and my neighbor? Wow. What do you know about politics? You have been in church all your life. There's no better place to learn about politics than church. You don't need to join PDP and APC to learn. How do I get to know that? Give me some 78, the last three verses. He also chose David, a servant. Where did he take him from? She falls from following the sheep, from following the bear. You are God's sheep. You are God's vineyard. Do you understand me? He took David from following the sheep. David was not part of the structure of governance in Israel. He took David from following the, from the sheepfold, from following the ewes. One of my friends called that a waste. <laughs> Don't blame him. He was a Yoruba man. <laughs> if he's watching America now, he'll be laughing. He got to Roe Park. He said, Roe Park. He saw this one is a ways. When he away, I hope I read. From following the ears that young, the had young, he brought him to do what? To shepherd Jacob, his people, and Israel his inheritance. So he shepherded them according to the integrity of his heart and guided them by the skillfulness of his hand. One of the problems we have in Nigeria today is that we think integrity is everything. No, integrity is not all. You need the skillfulness of hand. And there's no better place to learn it than when you mold destinies of people who come in dead and come alive in the church. We have learned our lessons. It's time to deploy what we have learned in the sheepfold to shepherd a nation. It's as simple as that. You may not understand it. You will understand it later. Let's read. Go back to Moses. Then at this saying, Moses fled and became a dweller in the land of Midian, where he had two sons. And when 40 years had passed, do you understand? By this time it was 80. Then the 400 years is complete. God is now about to do signs and wonders in Israel. Because he gave a time frame. He said they will afflict them 400 years. But then comes the time that he says, enough. And when 40 years had passed, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire in a bush in the wilderness of Mount Sinai. <laughs> when Moses saw it, he marveled at his sight. And as he drew near to observe, the voice of the Lord came to him, 
saying, I'm the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses trembled, and they are not Luke. Then the Lord said to him, take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. Why is it holy ground? Because holy God is there. I've surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt. You think God has not been hearing your prayers. You think he does not see your affliction. He does not see what you are going through. You fool yourself. He does. It's because the time of the promise is near. <laughs> I've surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt. I've heard their groaning and I've come down to deliver them. And how come I will send you to Egypt? No, God, you said you are coming down to deliver them. Why me? I use people, and I want to use you. The time and the season frame for your own involvement has come. You are 40 years early. You are running ahead of me. Now I've brought you to the sheepfold to teach you lessons of a shepherd. Now you have learned, I, 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 I'm a stammerer. No, we just read it was mighty in words and deeds. Now it was slow to speak. It was not ready to rush ahead because he knew why he had to flee. As a matter of fact, as I said to some people two days ago, God had to convince him. He said, those who are looking for you are dead. You watch what will happen in this country. Begin to watch. Everyone who is going to hinder what God has planned and purpose, it's not just COVID. Anything will kill them. You'll just be hearing, bah, bo, bah, bo, bah. Their death sentence is already released by heaven. They'll be falling by the right, by the left. They will not know what hit them. Do you understand this? Don't call me for funeral service because I will not attend. Moses was not there to attend when they were all removed. This Moses whom they rejected saying, who made you a ruler and a judge, is what God sent. He didn't just get up to go. God sent to be a ruler and a deliverer by the hand of the angel who appeared to him in the bush. Let's stop there. He brought them out after he had shown wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and in the Red Sea. And in the wilderness, for how long? 40 years. This time he was now 120. Now his age was framed in Genesis 6. I will not forever struggle with man. His years are 120. And Moses wrote about it. He said, our life is a tale that was told. Where was it told? In Genesis 6. He said, I'm 120 years old today. I cannot cross this Jordan. Do you understand it? Your life your age has been framed. Can I hear amen? Mm. Look at Psalm 105, 26 to 27. I'll round up with this. Psalm 105, 26 to 27. And he sent Moses his servant, and Aaron whom we had chosen. They performed his signs among them, and wonders in the land of Ham. Okay, give me now verse... 42 and 45 of Psalm 105, 42 and 45. Why did he do all these things in Psalm 105? He remembered what? His holy promise. Every promise of God is holy. He remembered his holy promise. And Abraham is servant. He brought out his people how? With joy. His chosen ones with gladness. When this is all over, joy will spread in this land. Amen. Gladness will be in every home, Amen. in every city, in every hamlet, in the mighty name of Jesus. Without a shadow of doubt, all these events in ages past were framed by the word of God. Do you agree? I showed you systematically how God fulfilled what he framed. Now, in the final analysis, when I get to where I'm going... I'm going to show you how what was framed for you, you will access it and bring them into manifestation. Ebenezer will be sung. My jensi she only she, my jensi wawa ye, my jensi akobata, my jensi wawa ye, my jensi she only she, my jensi wawa ye, my jensi akobata, my jensi wawa ye. Opo lo gbo wo elorun, o wa sise laye. Apollo she shall on to a bowl, I am a semilonisha, a little mare, oh, only boom, where she lie you before my mother left for heaven. She called me one morning. So, you see, this woman talking about my wife says she has walked in heaven. (laughs) 
So she has done all that work in heaven. She came to earth to earn, to just connect. I said, Mama, what about me? <laughs> he said, you mind your own business. Don't touch her. Don't do anything to her. Whatever she has for, give to her. She said, she gave us five children. They are not in hospital. They are not sick. They are doing well. She said, she she said, uh-huh. So before she says, uh, GB, money, money, money. Mm. <laughs> From what you have learned, is it true that the ages past were framed by the word of God? Yes. And is it also true that God worked out what he framed? Yes. We are going to call upon that God as we sing the hymn, Oh God, our help in ages past, our hope. For years to come. As it summarizes this song, Psalm 90. Psalm 90, Lord, you have been our dwelling place when I can't hear you. In him we live, in him we move, in him we have our being. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. 
before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Before the earth was framed, before the world was framed, God had you at the back of his mind. And he prepared a time and a season for your manifestation. This is your time. This is your chance. In the name of Jesus, your enemies will testify. In the mighty name of Jesus. I want you to pray, oh God, our help in ages past. Our hope for years to come. Be our everlasting shelter. Protect us from the arm and from the arrows of the enemy. Day and night. Remain our eternal home. Our shelter from the stormy blast. In the mighty name of Jesus. Before the hills in other stood. Our earth received a frame. From everlasting to everlasting. Thou art God. And to the endless years. The same. Oh God. Our help in ages past, our hope for years to come. Shall I begin to doubt God about the things he had said to me? How about the things he had fulfilled? When he said them to me back then, none was fulfilled. But I kept on believing. And I saw it, and I saw it, and I saw it. Some people came to him and said, Pastor, let's not deceive you. When the Citadel project began, we thought it was too much for us. And we didn't know how it would finish. But here we are in it. And the day we turned the sword, the day we raised the first, not did the first, first razor, I said, this citadel is a prototype of the new Nigeria. We will start, we will finish, and the world will come to learn how did they make it happen in Nigeria. In the name of Jesus, watch your ears of heart, your eyes will see. In Jesus' mighty name. Be seated. Our next example, I will do all that needs to be done with this second example next Sunday. Our next example for today is that of an Israeli captive who became the president of presidents in Babylon. And dominated the history of Babylon for 60 odd years. He arrived in Babylon as a teenager. Alongside with his three other prayerful companions. The name of this president of presidents, you know, Daniel. And his other three companions, Ananiah, Michelle, and Azariah. Otherwise known and called by the king as Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. People of God, the age these heroes of faith lived in was framed by the word of God, spoken through the mouth of prophet Isaiah to King Ezekiah. I told you wonderful things about him and I said to you, I will also let you see the other side because the best of men are still men at the very best. Turn your Bible with me to Isaiah 39. This is just introductory remarks to this phenomenal person. And next Sunday, I will show you six highlights of the challenges they faced because they were framed. And how they overcame every challenge to dominate Babylon for 60 years. Isaiah 39, verse 1 to 8. At that time, Merodach Baladan, the son of Baladan, king of Babylon, sent letters and a present to Ezekiah, for he heard that he had been sick and had recovered. And Ezekiah was pleased with them and showed them the house of his treasures, the silver and gold, the spices and precious ointment, and all his armory, all that was found among his treasures. Cousin Ezekiah, are you listening to me this morning? Mrs. Ezekiah, are you listening to me this morning? Every time you have visitors in your house, you show them everything. 
That's a stupid way to live. Showing off his false glory. All oh, this special living room and the furniture here we got from Italy. Oh, this one is from Turkey. Honey, do you remember where we got it? That one is from Turkey. And this other living room, I uh, can't even remember. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We went to the furniture capital of the world. Hey, hey, hey. Where is that? North Carolina. We got this from North Carolina. I see the, the wall, the paintings on the wall. They are very expensive. That one cost me $300,000. And this very chair that you are seeing is $50,000 each. Uh, <laughs> yeah. You like to show them everything. When he was showing them his treasure of gold, he did not show them his God who provided it. And God said, okay. You show them everything? Fine. Let's read. There was nothing in his house or in all his dominion that Ezekiah did not show them. Then Isaiah the prophet went to King Ezekiah and said to him, What did these men say and from where did they come to you? So Ezekiah said, oh, You know, they are beginning to recognize us. They came to me from a far country, from Babylon. Hear me this morning. If you're a prodigal son, you go to a far country from home and waste your substance. You will lose the values, the core values you learn from home, and you go and waste your substance. You think you are now free. You are prodigal. And if you do not go to a far country because you are matured, does not mean far country will not come to you. Either way, Babylon will try you at home, abroad. And he said, what have they seen in your house? So Hezekiah answered, they have seen all that is in my house. There's nothing among my treasures that I've not shown them. They left this place saying, wow, 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 come on, wow, wow. Are me? Are you for? Are me? Show them everything. I pastored this church by God's grace for over 30 years now. You can count on your fingers. Even amongst leaders, how many of them have entered my room? My main office is my sanctuary where I pray. I attend to everyone at the guest room. Can come to my house and not go beyond the outer court. And if you are close enough, you can come to the holy place. By holy of holies, no way. All my married life, my mother never entered into her bedroom, did she? If I come to your house, I'm not going to say, show me your bedroom. If you open your house to everybody, whatever you get at, after that, your headache, because not everybody that comes to your house are men and women of goodwill. Some have come to drop their demons to attack you, and their evil wish and desires, showing off his false glory. Then Isaiah said to Ezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord of hosts. Behold, the days are coming, O oh Lord, frame. God was about to frame the future of those things he showed them and his descendants that will follow. Behold, the days are coming when all that is in your house and what your fathers have accumulated until this day shall be carried to Babylon. Nothing shall be left, says the Lord, because rather than showing forth my glory to those people, you show forth your gold that I gave to you. May gold never replace God in your life. And if anyone asks you, how do you do this? By the grace of God. I am what I am by the grace of God. Everything I do must point to his glory. Stop showing everybody everything. Are you hearing me? Not only that, and they shall take away 
some of your sons who will descend from you. Are you listening? So they will be princes, not the riffraffs. They will take some of your sons who will descend from you, whom you will beget, and they shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. If they will be eunuchs, it means they were not born eunuchs. That's why you never heard about Mrs. Daniel, Mrs. Shadrach, Mrs. Abednego. They were made eunuchs when they got to Babylon so that they will focus on the service of the king and not be bothered about women. Sorry. Who caused all that? Ezekiah. They shall take away some of your sons who will descend from you, whom you will get, and they shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. So Ezekiah said to Isaiah, the word of the Lord which you have spoken is good. For he said, at least there will be peace and truth in my days. These are fathers and mothers that tell their children, and eat the portion of what belongs to their children's future now. Do you understand me? Because so it's so selfish, so self-centered, they use material things to control their children. Not understanding the fathers ought to lay in store for their sons. This guy said, whatever the Lord has said is good. Let there be peace in my own day. I will not mention the name of the man. His son said to me, hey, hey, call her, ah. You don't know who I'm talking about. So. That's your headache. That's your headache. I didn't lie. He told me. So let us see what Daniel, Furiko, Daniel chapter 1. Daniel chapter 1, verse 1 to 9. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand. We sum up the articles of the house of God, which he carried where? Into the land of China, to the house of his God. That's the headquarters of wickedness. I'll share that with you when I get into full detail. You don't know that the sons of this world are very wicked. You know, the Bible says <laughs> the wicked are estranged from the womb. As soon as they are born, they tell lies. Which he carried into the land of China to the house of his God. And he brought the articles into the treasure house of his God. Then king instructed Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuch, to bring some of the children of Israel, some of the king's descendants. Are you following? Can you see the prophecy of Isaiah there? And some of the nobles. Young men in whom there was no blemish. It's not talking of pimples, it's talking of character. But good looking, gifted how? In all wisdom, brain drain from Israel. Gifted in all wisdom, possessing knowledge, and quick to understand. Who had ability to serve in the king's palace, and whom they might teach what? The language and literature of the Chaldeans. Is there a difference between the two? Yes, big difference. You may speak Yoruba fluently and not understand this literature. Literature are couched in proverbs, in enigmas that you cannot decode. Do you understand me? They were learned, they will be taught the language and the literature of the Chaldeans. And the king appointed for them a daily provision of the king's delicacies of the wine which he drank and three years of training for them. You went to the university, didn't you? How many years did you spend? Four. Uh, you, you beat Daniel. Majority of the courses are three years. 
They took it from Babylon. Hello? So after three years, they give you a degree. And I have a degree in pharmacy. How many years? Three. Three. What have you done with it? Senior pharmacist. Well, for a while. Yeah. How many years did you spend? Four. Years. Four. You beat Daniel. Six. Six. Four. Four. Three. Three plus law school. Four. Uh -huh. How many did you spend? Three. This is from Babylon. You understand me? It's Babylonian attempt to access what Zion carries. Because if we don't teach them the land, this is the foolishness of Africans who will not teach and train their own children in their language. So they will teach them foreign language so that they will be attracted to foreign lands. We are foreign clothes. It's a three piece suit. <laughs> Eat foreign food. Like an eminent speaker said the other day, he said they will go to Sheraton Hotel and order for French fries in Ikeja. <laughs> so, what would they like to eat? Oh, give me some French fries. And the king appointed for them a daily provision of the king's delicacies and of the wine which he drank and three years of training for them so that at the end of that time they might serve before the king. Now from among those of the sons of Judah were Daniel, Ananiah, Mishael, and Azariah time bomb planted by God in Babylon according to his word. He framed their future. They found themselves in a strange land, but they knew how to connect the God of their fathers. I don't care what the enemy has put as a stumbling block on your way. Each stumbling block is going to become a stepping stone in the mighty name of Jesus. I don't, mind, I don't care what tears the enemy had sowed in your farm of wheat. The time of harvest had come. They will uproot them from your life. You are going to fulfill destiny. What has been framed by God, you will access. And you walk along the path of destiny in the mighty name of Jesus. I'm going to come back to Daniel and his companions next week. But for now, one closing prayer. Stand to your feet. And you're going to pray with me. Are you ready? Say with me, Father, in the name of Jesus, we pray. That the blunders of our past, present, and future leaders will no longer send the succeeding generations of our citizens into captivity in foreign lands. In the mighty name of Jesus, past blunders will not destroy future destinies. In Jesus' mighty name, we call upon God. Who framed everything by his word to grant us access into what he has framed for our generation so that we can live according to his plan, according to his purpose. We declare with one accord, your kingdom come, your will be done in Nigeria as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. I rest my case.